Hi guys. So welcome all together. I see still uh, the audience just filling up. Fantastic that you just reached out here to the meetup today. Uh, as it looks like meetup.com is down, but um, I think let's that's, uh, that's just work with it, live with it. Happy to have a year's audience. Uh, I'm also happy to uh, welcome Tanya um, from the UK today. Welcome, Tanya. Hello, hello. Thank you very much for having me around today. How was your day today? Uh, it's been all right. Just like regular day, a mixture of working on code and um, some meetings with our team. But still remote also on your side, yes? Yes, we uh, our team is fully distributed, so we are a remote first team. So everybody is like all around the world. Uh, we have a big bunch of folks in the US, um, so they're going to be taking a break for Thanksgiving. Ah, cool. Okay, <laughs> that's just if you have such a distributed team, that's uh, that's normal. I just see so many events taking place everywhere. Yeah, that's correct. What What do you do on a daily day base? Um, so, well, I work as a developer advocate for Microsoft uh, Azure, and I know that the title is very obscure, but um, partly a, a summary of my job is making developers and researchers work better. Uh, so I develop tools to make their workflows either, well, faster or easier or better. Um, I work with mostly data science and scientific computing communities. Um, I'm also um, visiting partner or industrial partner at the Alan Turing Institute. So I do a lot of research with folks there. Research? What kind of research? Uh, so it's all about machine learning and data science, um, like spanning like applications of machine learning in healthcare, uh, financial, uh, mental health as well, and education. Okay. And um, I, you, I think you're a data scientist by profession, right? Um, yes, well, I am a um, mechatronics engineer from formation, but then I went into data science and machine learning uh, for my PhD and then throughout my career. That's pretty much where I've been working. Okay, yes, you have a PhD and what was your, your topic, your subject? Um, so it was um, nanomaterials, computational nanomaterials, but it was all finding uh, material candidates that could be used for tissue replacement. So it was a lot of machine learning, optimization, modeling, different materials, different um, conditions within um, mechanical loads, biomechanical loads, and tissue growth. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, so our today's subject is actually some something from healthcare, right? That's correct. So what what's, what can we expect from today's uh, presentation from you? Um, so today I'm going to introduce a project that is called NRI. It's been uh, mostly research, uh, developed by the health intelligence team at, the, at our Microsoft Research Campus in Cambridge, UK. Um, and only back in September, we open source an SDK or, or a, li a Python library so that folks can start training their own models uh, using this open source framework. We're doing a lot of work uh, as open source projects, so like continuously evolving. And I'm going to do a presentation and then just like a very, very small demo um, on how you can get started and how some models are, um, how you can start building your own models. Interesting. Okay, cool. Uh, I just started the survey. You might have recognized that uh, just to get a little bit of understanding of who's actually visiting us today and listening to us. So, um, Let's stop that for a second. I think we got a lot of uh, responses already. Um, so I ask actually, how would you self-describe your level of knowledge in computer vision or machine learning? And so the majority is um, would call themselves a novice in the field. So that's interesting. We have 25% um, advanced, 25% uh, researchers as well. So it's a good split, uh, a quite interesting split. I also ask about the profession of the people and 40% are data scientists, 10% uh, software engineers. We have one industry practitioner. Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. And we have 40% other uh, for all those people who just uh, 
made made or said uh, offer. It would be interesting to hear a little bit more about what kind of a profession you have, which helps a little bit to focus here. Uh, just just to explain the rules. Uh, Tanya will be allowed to take the floor in a second, so when I stop talking here, and she will go into step into the presentation. We have you. You have in the pane. You will have that kind of Q and A section. If you click on that icon, you can see you can ask questions all the time. Yes, I will monitor the questions. It's not Tanya. Tanya can focus purely on her presentation, but I will make sure that we can answer or ask the questions during the presentation, and that everything will get answered in some ways. So just feel free uh, also to ask the questions you have, anything which is burning, uh, which you are passionate about. I uh, always feel uh, welcome to do that. Tanya, I'm really happy to have you here today and I'm really looking forward to Inner Eye and what you have to tell us about that. Thank you very much again. So let me just share my screen. Should have my slides there on your yep. screen. Um, as I said, I'm going to be presenting a project called Inner Eye, which has been um, developed by the health intelligence team at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, UK. We have um, other research teams in other parts of the world, uh, but this mostly has been done in the UK, so um, it's local to me. Uh, I'm going to share a bit of the vision and the wider revision of machine learning tools in healthcare and worries that inner eye uh, fits within this. Sounds good. Um, well, medical images are, are perhaps the biggest source of routinely used digital data in healthcare uh, as today. Those of you that are industry practitioners or work in the healthcare industry will be probably familiar with this. Um, PACS systems basically are um, the systems in charge of managing all this data in digital form. Um, but although all of this imaging is digital, we still require human, like human people or experts um, that will basically eyeball the images. Um, at the moment, we're at the cost of technology being able to help discern measurements from medical images. And this is basically where Project Inner Eye hopes to help enable AI for radiomics. So the vision of, um, in, of InterI is to help enhance the current or the existing healthcare workflows, especially for medical imaging. Um, and one of the reasons is because precision, precision radiotherapy or any other um, medical imaging involving workflows uh, can be very, very time consuming. When we talk about cancer treatment, for example, there are three main ways in which we can treat the patients. Um, the first one may be a surgery where a surgeon will physically remove the tumor from the body. Then we'll have also chemotherapy where we are using drugs to kill cancer cells. And finally, we have radiotherapy where uh, clinicians use high doses of radiation to kill cancer cells and, and shrink the tumors. Um, in radiotherapy, mostly oncologists use a linear accelerator for radiotherapy delivery. And, and this machine that provides the linear, well, this machine is called LINAC uh, and moves around the patient in order to deliver the dose. Now, because this, this machine moves or around the patient. It, it requires a very precise execution plan uh, so that we can maximize the radiation dose over the cancer cells um, and minimize it on the health edition. So we, here we're dealing with an, a, a very low or a very low level optimization problem. Um, and this, this, this plan normally is uh, created or traced by a radiation oncologist. And there are multiple steps that need to be followed for this. Uh, first, the patient is scanned or, or he receives a set of the scans um, using CTs. Um, so these are three-dimensional 
and the clinician is basically in charge of drawing with very, very high precision in the images delineating where is the target. So that's the little video that you've been seeing um, and how the clinician is going around the contour um, of this target, trying to avoid hitting any organs or as much health dish as possible. This is a very typical tool or a very typical workflow used nowadays by clinicians. Um, and you can imagine that it is very, very time consuming because uh, this person will have to draw in dozens or like, yeah, tens of slices, um, delineating multiple structures with as much precision as, as possible. And because this very manual or la manual labor intensive process can take anything between 10, 20 minutes to several hours, depending on one, the body part that is being targeted, um, the contours of, um, of the structures that need to be traced. And it is like very, a very, very involved process. There is another approach, uh, which is image guide radiotherapy planning, um, where is basically is one of the examples where there is opportunity for this type of technology to make a clinical impact. And we're talking about projects like InnerEye, uh, AI um, supported medical imaging procedures, but the treatment itself requires still a manual dose planning procedure where the radiation oncologists manually delineate the tumors. And there is also uh, a clear demand in standardizing the quality of this procedure across hospitals. Um, the team at Microsoft Research uh, have been doing or working on efforts um, that focus on prostate, head and neck cancer uh, radiotherapy for for quite a few years now. It's actually one of the areas where these folks have been spending a lot, a lot of time researching um, and collaborating with different institutions. So now when we look at the full workflow uh, for radiotherapy, um, we can see that there are multiple steps. So I mentioned before that one of the, the, the first step for this radiotherapy workflows is to acquire the planning scans. Um, so this will be the CT scans for the patient. Then the patient will have to go home and the clinician will have to do the manual delineation uh, from the scans to create the dose plan. And then the patient will come back for multiple fractions of radiotherapy treatment um, but it all parts or all of these different dosages or, or subsequent treatments part from the initial manual 3D delineation. And you can imagine that, there, that this is not optimal um, because as the, treat, the patient is, re, um, is receiving the different dosages of treatment and is going home and then coming back for the next dosage, um, then the patient the patient's body as well as the contour, um, the contours are changing. So it's not an optimal solution. And the, the goal or, or one of the main aims of inner eye within this workflow is replacing the manual segmentation with automatic segmentation. Um, and this has as main effect, not only making the segmentation much faster, but it also allows for new flows, uh, for new workflows to happen. So we could imagine that there is gonna be adaptive radiotherapy where multiple plans are done during the treatment. So instead of having one single initial plan that is carried throughout entire treatment of the patient or the oncological patient, um, this is going to be optimized depending on the various stages of recovery uh, or various stages of treatment. Um, so this will actually be an enhanced uh, radiotherapy treatment uh, drive by optimized workflows. Uh, 
Um, the project in our IT team, uh, there are a bunch of very, very amazing folks and have been working on these deep learning techniques um, for state-of-the-art image segmentation. I think this whole project has been um, has been on the works for about 10 years now, um, and it has gone through multiple iterations. Uh, the most updated um, well, actually, I don't have the latest paper, but we're going to be—they're uh, going to be publishing an updated research paper in the next few weeks. Um, so, if you're interested in learning more about uh, the algorithms that are now powering um, inner eye, the neural arc, uh, network architectures that are currently being used, keep an eye on the inner eye project page. Everything is going to be linked there. Um, but for this late, latest situation of uh, inner eye, we're leveraging the power and harnessing the power of deep learning and convolutional neural networks, um, which allows us to scale this to much larger data sets um, and, and like train very, very big data or volumes of 3D images. Um, now, a lot of the work that has been done over this uh, 10 years as part of the Inright project, uh, the team has been partnering closely with Cambridge University hospitals um, to make sure that these research models deliver clinical value so that um, actually there is potential value and impact um, within in actual or real life clinicians workflows. On the 22nd of September, um, as I mentioned in the introduction or the intro, the fireside chat that we had, or I had with Stefan, um, on the 22nd of September, we announced that now all of the inner eye code is open source. And this was done because our aim is to democratize the access to build AI models at scale using Microsoft Azure Cloud or Microsoft Azure Public Cloud. And the, Microsoft really wants to empower organizations like the NHS, uh, that is our national healthcare system in the UK, to become AI companies, leverage the data, leverage machine learning, deep learning to improve patients' lives. Tanya, a quick question. Uh, so you said it's open source, uh, and I posted uh, on meetup.com, I posted also a link to GitHub. Uh, so what was the idea of making it open source? So as I said, um, the idea of making it open source is enable other, other people in the industry, other hospitals around the world um, to start building um, high quality scalable machine learning models. Um, so that they can start uh, enhancing and improving their one their their clinician workflows and also the, the inpatient workflows um, to enhance um, the patient's treatments. Um, this has been a, in the long run for a while, um, and the idea is that basically you can use uh, the public cloud and whatever you're using uh, as public cloud to do the, the training and then host your models, um, but using open source as um, the open source SDK to develop, as, uh, develop the models. I know that I have a question there, what is exactly open source pre-trained models, network architecture, data images? And that is a very, very um, important question. So what we are open sourcing, um, is the actual toolkit. So if you are familiar with frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, Spacey, for example, for NLP, uh, InnerEye is a similar workflow. Um, the models are not being open sourced, um, especially because when you're developing models, you're still um, you're still responsible for testing validation uh, of them. And you need to, to make sure um, that, you, that all your models are held in to, stand, to certain standards um, rather than doing, you know, like um, 
black boxing diagnosis for patients. So the person that is developing the models um, is still responsible for um, as well the governance process for the data, privacy, um, privacy concerns, uh, having ed the correspondent ethical approvals. So what is open source is the, the toolkit for you to start building your models um, and you can start submitting them, like as I said, for example, using a short cloud as your public cloud. Um, can inner eyes open source code help labs segment their own image data in context outside of radiotherapy planning? Oh, that's very, uh, very interesting. Yes. So um, there is within the open source inner deep, inner eye, sorry, uh, within the inner eye deep learning toolkit, um, we have some sub modules that allows you to create your own data sets. Uh, perform segmentation or, or classification, but again, you have to build your own uh, your own workflows. Um, so, for example, if you have uh, data that come from DICOM, um, well, that are in the DICOM format, uh, we can we have a special module inside the Inner Eye Toolkit that will allow you to uh, to, to segment your data um, or pre-process your data as well. I'm just wondering, you make me um, unemployed here. <laughs> oh, no, of course not. <laughs> They're awesome. It's awesome. Uh, we still you. need, um, as I mentioned before, we still need uh, nothing replaces like the human in the loop, like to do all of the validation, verification, compliance. Um, so we always need a home, the, the human in the loop uh, within deep learning. I think we're still very, very far or yeah, I don't think the human will ever be completely replaced by uh, machine learning, but that's another whole different talk. Don't don't worry about that. I just meant you make me unemployed as a moderator, just as answering. The question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So don't be afraid about what I said. It was just that. Well, fantastic. It's good. Yeah, so... Um... It is not just uh, for radiotherapy planning. These are like the most commonly used cases that, are, that the inner eye uh, deep learning team have been exploring, but you could totally use for other contexts um, mm -hmm. using medical imaging. So you said it's, it was just released September 20, as it was just two, two months ago, right? That's correct, yeah. So did you have already some sort of feedback? I mean, it's coronavirus time, so everybody's a little bit focused on yeah. things. So we've already, um, there are now a few issues opened. Uh, there have also had a couple of pull requests. Um, and the team and I are going to be working like quite closely to improve the developer ex experience, making sure that um, we can provide as as well, really good documentation for folks to get started, some tutorials. Um, we have some big announcements coming in the next few weeks, as well as the research paper. Um, and we're going to try to build a community around a open source project, like um, for all of the other machine learning frameworks outside. Um, so again, there is a, oh, sorry, there is the, the link. Um, to the main project webpage. And if you go to GitHub, um, the code is in Microsoft slash inner ally. Um, I forgot again. Yeah, so inner eye deep learning, one of, one of the advantages, I think I've already mentioned some of this. It allows you to build state-of-the-art 3D and 2D medical, medical imaging classification segmentations or sequential models at scale. Um, again, it allows you, if you're using the public cloud, um, it allows you to leverage that without having to you run and maintain your Elastic uh, GPU cluster. And also because uh, it allows you to leverage, um, to leverage Azure machine learning, it enables you to follow best practices to build uh, your AI, 
AI models uh, allowing you to leverage practices like MLOps. Um, so this means that whenever you're a training model, we are registering the model, it has a specific version. So those are data. Uh, we also keep track if you're using things like hyperparameter tuning. We also keep track of the hyperparameters um, that were tested or evaluated as, as part of your training. So it really has a reproducibility first approach um, for us working with machine learning. Valeria, you had just another question here about the infrastructure. Oh, yeah. Um, I was wondering whether you may comment a little bit more about the infrastructure in Asia using InnerEye and whether you could share any lesson learned on model scalability and training in the cloud while working at the Right, point. yes. Um, so I don't have a slide where we have the, the full workflow, actually. Um, but I do have... Uh, uh, a slide, a handy slide. It was like cute. Uh, where we have the technology stack. Um, the way that it works at the moment is you have your in the top level your configuration and model templates. You have your active learning, and we allows you to define whether you're doing parallel cross validation and ensemble models, uh, which is very very nice depending on whether you're working with uh, 3D to do segmentation or you're wanting to build uh, multimodality sequential models. Then inner eye sits in there with an, uh, within, between your configuration and PyTorch. So we're using actually PyTorch uh, for a lot of uh, the deep learning uh, things like building our deep neural networks. And then when it comes to the infrastructure itself or to the architecture itself, uh, you have to two main branches. If, for example, you are an, any, an institution like the NHS or a, a clinical institution or a research institution that has a sure stack hub, you can leverage that. And basically, you'll have your whole uh, clinician or your whole clinical um, workflow on premises. If you don't have a sure stack hub and you don't have your uh, cloud infrastructure, or sorry, your, your compute infrastructure on prem, you have the option of using a sure machine learning uh, or a sure public cloud. So you don't have to worry about maintaining your clusters, having your on prem architecture. Um, but if, for example, for those that are not familiar with Azure Machine Learning, you have on one side um, VMs preloaded with a lot of the data science stack that comes like um, with Python, our TensorFlow, PyTorch. Oh, is there any specific reason to use PyTorch? I'm probably going to get back to that in a bit. Um, Azure Machine Learning um, allows you to, to leverage the virtual machines that we have there, as well as the MLOps components that I was uh, mentioning before, that is like all the model and data versioning that we already have. Um, and then as, as well, it allows you, it gives you a very elastic compute, meaning that you can, um, you can switch from CPUs to GPUs very seamlessly. Um, increase the notes, increase the size of your virtual machine, depending on, on what you need. Um, and it also directly integrates with, um, with Azure Blob Storage and wherever you have your, your data set. So that, those are the two architectures that you can have. Um, ha scalable machine learning models, uh, learnings, I'll probably share later on um, in the long Q and A after or after the the, the presentation, uh, there is a lot. You can see we have a lot more questions coming in. Uh, so from one one from the audience uh, is actually asking, uh, you mentioned Azure here, uh, but can this uh, model be run and deployed for full stack on any cloud platform or old school on premise? Yeah, well at the moment um, we the open source uh, SDK allows you to run an Azure machine learning by default. Um, there is no to say that 
that can be extended then for you to use any other public cloud. Um, we'll probably have to work on that. If, if that is something that the community uh, really, really needs and would be interested in, we can always work in the spirit of open source and extend that. Um, old school on-premises, oh, I don't know, um, but I can investigate that for you. Awesome. Um, I will get back to Stefan with an answer for, for that. Um, that is something I don't have an answer for. Thank you, Tanya. Alistair is also asking um, a question about, about a model training. So once a model is trained, how would this be used on clinical imaging in the day-to-day -day practice or really in the day when, when you're at work? Can it link into PAX radiology systems directly or must be images be changed to certain formats? Any regard? Um, so the deal uh, would be to link it directly to PAX um, so that it can be integrated within your workflow. Alistair, do you think it's sufficient for you? Or more, more details, just send me a question again. Thanks, thanks, Tanya, yeah, so okay. far. Um, don't worry. Um, off. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, we have the, um, the open source project. Like the question that someone asked before, I can't remember who it was about using other public clouds. Yes. Um, if anyone is interested in medical AI or medical imaging AI or contribute to open source, or uh, there is a feature that you would like to see or would, like, would make your medical imaging workflow better, we welcome all kinds of contributors, uh, all kinds of contributing, uh, contributions, sorry. Uh, when it comes to road mapping, requesting features, uh, raising issues or bugs, creating pull requests, um, no matter what kind of contribution. There is no small contributions, um, whether it's using the toolkit, extending the toolkit in new directions. Um, the, project, the open source project itself is very, very new. Um, so, we're going to be working on it a lot over the next few months to make sure that it it, it actually helps the open source community. Um, but note that this toolkit is the is an open research tool, um, and so, as I mentioned it before, and I, I really really want to make uh, stresses you or whoever is developing the models with. Um, Inner eye, as is with any other deep learning framework, you're responsible for the performance, you're responsible for the testing, and any other regulatory clearance uh, for any of the models produced by the toolkit. Um, I don't know uh, how this is, for example, in other countries like Switzerland, uh, but in the UK, any models uh, that are meant to guide. Uh, clinical decisions are considered medical devices, so they have to go through tight regulatory processes. Um, so that is also one of the reasons why we are not directly open sourcing pre-trained models, because uh, whoever is using this needs to have like entire confidence and oversee the governance process for, for this. Fantastic. More questions here. Vasily, do you utilize any active learning methods to reduce the annotation load for 2D, 3D classification? Oh. Sorry about that. I think that is another question that I'm going to have to ask. Um, I can't remember at the moment. Um, uh, let me think about it. Um, but yeah, as, as I said, like also um, InterEye and the whole uh, team and the USL, um, sorry, UCL University, that is the University College London, um, have been working on COVID-19 use cases. 
Um, so there is an active collaboration with the University College London Hospitals, the University Hospitals Birmingham, on projects using Azure and InnerI. So this is an example uh, of using the toolkit beyond clinical radiotherapy scenarios. Um, so this can be definitely extended to, to many, many other areas um, in health. Um, Specifically, this project that is related to pandemic preparedness are part of a big Microsoft initiative uh, from our chief scientific officer. Um, and basically, they bring together the expertise, the creativity, and passion to solve uh, challenges with COVID-19, which we you know has been what we've been talking about pretty much all this year. Um, and in fact, the university, you uh, the University Hospitals Birmingham is um, aiming to start validating what some of the models or one of the models uh, that have been developed in collaboration in the next few weeks and months. Um, and the idea is to help them to reach patients in the front line using X-ray data. Um, so hopefully, this will improve again the inpatient workflows. Um, in front of this current situation that we are facing. And um, before that, I wanted to just like, it's a, to show you the, the, some of the many people that are working in Inner Eye. It's a truly multidisciplinary team, uh, the Health Intelligence Group. Um, we have a lot of folks across MSR. We've been working uh, with research software engineers, and now um, myself is joining as well. How long have you been there? So you just started recently, right? Yes. So I only started working with the project Inner Eye uh, later this year, about six months ago. Um, but Javier Alvarez Valle has been pretty much um, leading the project for for quite a while. Uh, Raj, uh, Dr. Raj Gina has been doing um, a lot of uh, has been a, a very very good collaborator for um, the head and neck uh, use cases, and and the team is like amazing and 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 very excited. Um, about what's coming within our eye. Awesome. Um, and just, just to close the presentation side, um, you can find more. There is a project page. I put it everywhere already. Um, and there is the GitHub uh, repository as well. And we also have, uh, for any of you, we have a special team dedicated if you're interested in uh, working with inner eye for toolkits for your clinical cases, for your in house clinical cases. Uh, we have um, a special dedicated team that will be able to help you with that. And I think that is it for the first. my other screen now. I can see your code. Good. Um, so if you go to the project yeah, just, in our eye. Before we lose the question from Yelena, she was asking, what are you using for inferencing? WinML? Um, WinML. Yes. No. Um, Windows Machine Learning. No. It is, um, so mostly I've been using Azure Machine Learning. Um, and as I said, it uses mostly open source frameworks. Um, so all of this is, top, is on top of PyTorch and all other common li uh, Python libraries for, uh, for machine learning and deep learning. And just a, just a note uh, aside here, 
Um, for the questions which uh, Tanya promised to answer, and that's, that's fantastic that you do that, uh, I will upload the answers to the YouTube channel. So next to the video, to the video recording, so you get the answers anyway, yes. Uh, I also posted the link to the video channel in our chat, and it will anyway be distributed via the email and newsletter. Thank you. Sorry, Tanya. No, that's fine. That's absolutely perfect. Um, so yeah, again, this is like the 50th time that I present this repo. Um, if you want to get started, uh, we have, uh, the, of, of course, the instructions for you to install. We're working on creating a proper Conda pack, well, uh, having this in Conda Forage as well as um, more robust packaging. But also, uh, we have some mini tutorials on how you can start setting up your environment, train uh, a segmentation model if you want to integrate with Azure Machine Learning and all the way to your deployment. Um, so make sure to check it out. Um, I'm gonna actually show you. So I'm gonna first run uh, the inner eye hello world. I should have it here, which is what we normally start with in most of the things. Um, so again, you can, if uh, one of the nice things is if you are using Azure Machine Learning and you're familiar with that, you can use that for the training. If you have a powerful enough local computer, you can also do the training locally. So um, there is no limitation. Well, there is no um, absolute need to do everything on Azure Machine Learning. Um, this is a hello world. This is the, the most getting started. Um, uh, the most like basic or getting started model. Um, that is to train a pre-configured model uh, for two epochs. So it's it's very, very small training. And we're using a dummy data set, uh, which is a synthetic data set that we've created for this purpose. Um, and this model uses um, a subclass segmentation model base, which is the base for all segmentation model configs. Um, so that's a base class that InnerI has, and then you can extend it for your use, particular use cases, depending on the medical imaging data that you're working with. Um, we're also configuring uh, unit 3D, and we are using configuring Azure EPR drive base parameter research. Again, if you're not using Azure Machine Learning um, for your compute, of course, that Azure Hyperdrive parameter is not going to run. Um, so it's just going to do the more, um, just like um, the traditional model training. Um, I'm not going to go over all of these configurations, but here is where we do all the model definition. We, here is where we configure the model. Uh, in this case, our dummy, dummy data set only has two channels, but depending on what, again, and what Im medical imaging you're using, you can have two, three, four, whatever channels uh, you have. And here is where we are uh, doing the actual configuration. Let me make this a bit bigger so that you can see. Um, oh, sorry. I made it too big and now I lost that. Here it is. Uh, where we're doing the actual, uh, creating the configurations for training and testing. Um, so if you have access to GPU, you can by default use GPU. We specify the number of epochs, so very similar to as you would do in, in PyTorch or else, you can define your, your epochs. Um, and all of those, that should have, we should have. Again. Um, we're also getting the, we're also splitting the data set for training and testing for, for cross validation as well. And if you're using, if we're using uh, Azure Machine Learning, this is the actual uh, little bit that would do the hyperparameter search or use Azure Hyperdrive uh, 
for the hyperparameter research. So, because I've already set my, oh, my environment. And I don't know why it is cut. Oh, there you go. Um, so I am using a conda environment. I've already created everything. I'm just gonna show you what is in my environment so we all know. There you go. Um, so I've created this environment. Um, we already provide an environment demo file in InnerI and you can use that as a base. Um, and you can add any other Python libraries. I say it uses PyTorch. Um, it already contains uh, all the different SDKs so that you can start interacting with Azure Machine Learning. Um, we use Jupyter because after we've done the training, we create a Jupyter notebook that will provide a report uh, with your training, well, yeah, of, of your model training. And it is a, a lot of, um, as I mentioned before, the, the traditional Python machine learning libraries. So I've already sorted um, all of my, oh, actually I'm gonna go here, all of my environment. So I'm just gonna run this. The, here I'm calling a runner, and this is probably one of the most important parts in in inner eye. Um, so in the runner, I've mentioned before that when you train a model, it generates a Jupyter notebook um, containing the report of your train or, or, or your workflow as well as a HTML version. And you can change uh, the names here. You can upload directly to Azure Blob or, or whatever you need to. And this is the actual uh, script that will allow you to, to run and, and do all of your retraining. Your models. Here you can see, let me go here. Um, so once I've called that hello world model, uh, you get a, a big, big, big output. Uh, again, you get a display of all the configurations that you uh, that you specified. And you get, um, you get a display on whenever it, or how the training is going as well, how long it actually took, uh, it creates the checkpoints. Now, this is super uh, interesting because I didn't, if you see when I uh, called this model, I didn't specify a sure machine learning. I'm doing this in my local computer. Uh, so you get a warning saying that the model is not being registered um, because it doesn't have an associate experiment. So there is no word to, to register this model. Oh, let me, if I go to outputs, here is where all the outputs are. Um, if we go, it has the different checkpoints. Uh, we have the logs, patch sampling, and then this is the report that it generates. Um, I'm going to say trust. Again, it will provide uh, the path so everything is so that it can be reproduced by somebody else. So you get like. Um, a, a complete log of what you're doing with your model or for training your model or for your classification and segmentation. Um, and you can, this is parting from a very, very simple template, um, but under the hood, uh, you can modify the template and create uh, your very own version of the reports. 
which is very, very handy, especially if you need to share with your colleagues. Um, I'm going to also now show you, because um, this was a very simple example, uh, just from a dummy data set, from a dummy variables, uh, everything which is very, very simple. Um, I have downloaded a data set um, that is for glaucoma de detection. I'm going to, I can send you the link to the sample data set. Yeah, that would be good. I can send you the link, or I should have it here. Give me a second. Probably not. I'll send you the link. Can you um, have a chat window? I'll have to look at it again. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but if you look here, I have it in my downloads. Um, I have it in my downloads. It is uh, a big bunch of .mpy files. So the first step for me would be to make sure that I can actually use this data set. So I'm going to use um, InnerEye, that great data set uh, module that I was talking about at the beginning. Um, oh, oh, I know why. Sorry, I changed my um, my path again. Okay. So that will create a data set, and because I already did it before, um. I already had a data set, but it's going to create a CSV file um, with the actual data set in, in a, a usable format. And I have now up, uh, uploaded that as well on my Azure blob storage. So I'm going to be using this Glaucoma public. Um, and here is the Azure dataset ID that I am using. Um, I was very, very lazy and I didn't rename it because this is for a demo. Um, but I've already uploaded this dataset for it to my Azure blob storage. Um, and you can, whatever name that you have, um, we have a settings YAML file where you can uh, link to your workspace, to your Azure machine learning workspace, to your Azure blob storage. Um, so you can run everything there directly. Uh, and in this case, we're using a we're doing a classification model to diagnose patients with glaucoma pathology, and we're using um, retinal OCD scans. Oh, here and this is a reference for the model. And just let me glaucoma. In this case, I'm going to be using actually Azure Machine Learning. So um, the difference is that I'm actually passing this flag that is Azure Machine Learning true. Um, again, it, very, very big output. We have to sanitize that output. And it's going to take a tiny bit more um, because it's going to here it is. Um, so it, it connects directly to my Azure Machine Learning Workspace, uh, then to my Azure Blob Storage, um, and then retrieves the data set. So you don't have to have the data sets locally, uh, especially when working with, with medical imaging data. You can have a few gigabytes, uh, if not more, of data there, and, and we don't want that. Um, it also tells you uh, that it has queued and you run for experiments. So all of this is in Azure Machine Learning. Um, it tells you when the submission has been done and you can actually use. So if you click here, the experiments. Oh, it opened my other. Experiments. 
it's going to load my Azure Machine Learning workspace. Um, and I can see here uh, the runs. I can see the compute target. This is the, um, the virtual machine that I am using. It gives you the input data ID, the repo uh, ID if you have one. Uh, it links directly to the git commit if you have an associated git commit to your model. And here are the different tags, um, depending on who's, for example, exec uh, executing this workflow, it tells you who is who is executing is executing this. Um, in this case, it's me, it's my username. It comes from the master branch. So this is what actually allows you to, um, to keep track of all your models, have uh, software engineering best practices first. Um, I don't think I have here. Should have a failed run. Yes. And you can see here all, all of the logs. Um, so it tells you what is that was happening. Um, I should be able to actually see why this one failed. Um, and then depending on uh, whatever, it, it, I didn't enable hyperdrive as well. Um, but if that were the case, if you had done hyperparameter tuning or auto hyperparameter tuning in there, uh, you would be able to see the metrics. Um, sorry, the, the parameters history in here in metrics. You would be able to see your, your graphs um, and you could add that to your um, to your Jupyter Notebook report. Uh, this is also, it will provide a URL for the run. So you can see all of that. And you can also, if this fails, let's say for, for anything, you can restart, uh, you can restart your run using this recovery flag. Um, so if it was paused or, or halted at some point, you'll, you're able to, to rerun or you modify parameters and run from the last checkpoint. And for those of you that uh, like using TensorFlow, uh, TensorBoard locally, um, we also provide a script so that you can display your um, your experiment run locally in a TensorFlow, a TensorBoard, sorry, um, and can monitor that. And I think I've taken all of my time already. So. Oh, that's fantastic. There's another question from Valerio. Any particular striking feature included in InnerEye that you feel it should be mentioned also compared to other frameworks for DL for medical images, e.g. Moonai? Um, so I think um, one of the most and I think this, this will tie a lot with uh, what Valerio asked at the very, very beginning. Uh, InnerEye is um, designed in mind for highly scalable uh, models. Um, so you can work scale up and scale down as you need it. Um, because we, it was made with a high compute perspective first, as well as uh, having the MLOps. It not only allows you, it not allows you to not only allows you to scale your compute, um, which is very 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 important. I think the, the amount of like how much data uh, we're working on with this days um, definitely has been demanding more compute. Uh, but again, I think. And, and this is probably my personal pet peeve. I am very, very concerned when reproducibility, data lineage, um, and the fact that by default, NRI allows you to, to keep track of your model and data lineage as well as your model versions and track for reproducibility is something, um, it's a very, very important and nice feature to have by default. Because um, we all know how hard this is, how how hard to achieve reproducible machine learning and machine learning workloads is. 
Um, so this is already making it a bit easier for you out of the box. Um, and I think especially in highly regulated industries like medical, that's something that we always have to think uh, first and foremost. Cool, thank you, Tanya. We loved your wonderful desktop background. On this oh, side. thank you. <laughs> that is my background. Yes. <laughs> Sharing. Cool. So do we have open questions still from the audience? I think all questions have been answered. Tanya. I, I know that there are still a few questions that were left unanswered. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask this directly to uh, the other teams in the development um, awesome. side, and I'll get back to Stefan so he can share with you. Yeah, that would be great. I made, I made screenshots of the questions so I don't lose them. Oh, that, that, that would be very helpful. Okay. So I think it was two, two questions, basically. And I, I will send it by email. So just as a reminder, um, anything, so the recording will be available probably uh, in the next two days. Um, and I will upload it to the YouTube channel. Uh, Tanya, it was an awesome presentation. Thank you for taking the time and to show you, uh, show us uh, inner eye today. And I think there still probably might a lot of questions be open, uh, which can be answered by when, when we use it, uh, since it is open source, which is fantastic. Yep. We can work with it. Of course, yeah. As I mentioned before, um, the project is completely open to uh, contributions. Um, as I said, from contributing to the code, to the documentation, um, requesting features, raising bugs, all of this is going to be massively appreciated um, because it's free on the project sale where it's going to be changing quite a lot in the next few months. Um, and But I think it's great if we start getting feedback and, and ideas and, and bugs from the community so that we can direct our efforts to where it's the most needed. So also we get feedback from your audience. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think uh, you deserve it. It was wonderful. So guys, uh, thanks for again for having been part of this journey today. Uh, I was sorry, but meetup.com was unavailable, but hey, you were here. I'm I think it's fantastic. But we will have a recording available, as I mentioned. Um, we are always open for, for questions. So if you have more questions, just let me know. Uh, Florian and, and Tanya, I would just uh, would like to have you stay a little bit longer. For anyone else, uh, I don't know what time it is at your location. It's evening, it's morning, it's afternoon, whatever it is. I wish you a, a wonderful day, wonderful evening, and hope to see you again next week um, when we talk about industrial AI, which will be also a quite interesting talk. Thanks again for joining, and bye-bye. Thank you very much.